So I want to also thank uh, John and, and Mort for the kind invitation to be back here and uh, for an opportunity to debate uh, truly one of the rising stars in our field and to talk about obinutuzumab versus rituximab. So I have the con position, and I'm going to argue that I actually have the easier one because that's where the data will lead you. So you've already heard that rituximab has had a major impact on lymphoma. We know this, and we know these slides quite well. Um, but I'm just going to emphasize that not only does uh, rituximab have this impact of an increased cure rate in aggressive lymphomas, longer progression-free survival in indolent lymphomas, non-overlapping toxicity with chemo, and the ability for extended dosing, but when you look at the key and pivotal trials, look at the magnitude of difference. This is what a home run is, right? There is a huge difference in overall survival. The two curves on the left are for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. The curve on the, all the way on the right is from the PRIMA trial for follicular lymphoma. And in the PRIMA trial, even for 10 years, people who got induction chemoimmunotherapy followed by two years of maintenance, at 10 years, half of patients have not needed more therapy. I think these are data that really make a huge impact in how we treat our patients. So the question then is, rituximab has set a bar. So what would compel a change in practice? And I would argue that we need something that is better, safer, and cheaper. What does better mean for our patients? It means improved PFS. Certainly that is a reasonable goal, but it has to be a substantial improvement in PFS. Uh, improved survival would be incredible. I, I don't think we're there yet, and cure would be even better than that. In terms of safer, we have to think about short-term toxicity, long-term toxicity, and the need for supportive care. So if you have deeper remissions, but it comes with an increased need for IVIG, I'm not really sure that that is altogether better. And certainly cheaper goes without saying. So the question now is, does obinutuzumab fit the bill? Is it better, safer, cheaper? Well, we know it's different. Uh, we know that it has many uh, real and potential advantages over rituximab in terms of how it works. It's a type 2 antibody, which uh, leads to decreased reliance on uh, complement-dependent cytotoxicity. There is much more direct cell death, uh, and there's increased effector cell-mediated ADCC because the FC portion is, a little, is glycoengineered. Uh, and so there are many reasons that this should be a better antibody. And so the question is, where does the clinical data take us? And uh, I also will just say that it's really nice to be able to have head-to-head -head comparisons so that we can think about this for our patients. And I give a lot of credit to the company, companies to, to do these head-to-head -head comparisons that are often very difficult uh, to design. So there are multiple studies looking at obinutuzumab in lymphomas, and I did leave out CLL because that uh, had its own session yesterday, but I do think that's probably the one lymphoid malignancy where the data is quite strong in favor of obinutuzumab. But here, if we look at the other lymphomas, we have several head-to-head -head comparisons, which I've put uh, in circles here, but we have a number of other studies as well that we can look at. So I'm going to start first uh, with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So our CHOP, we just said, has set a bar, right? So we can cure, on average, if we look at even the most current studies, 70% uh, progression-free survival and about an 80% overall survival. That's what the data would tell us. But we know that it's not a home run in everybody. We know that there are people where the likelihood of cure sequentially declines if you have any one of these high-risk features. And I think it's uh, very clear from all the studies that are going on, from what we see in our clinic, that it is time to move beyond our CHOP for all. So is obinutuzumab CHOP or G-CHOP going to be the answer? And uh, here's a picture of Goya. Um, but this was a head-to-head -head comparison of our CHOP versus uh, obinutuzumab CHOP in frontline diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, focusing on some of the higher risk patients. So this is a very large trial, 1,400 patients, looking at patients with an IPI greater than or equal to 2, or IPI 1 that is under 60, or with bulky disease. And uh, you can see here some of the comparisons. And what I'll just point out is that the median age is 62. Um, I'll say... Uh, 37% of patients had bulky disease, and then if you look here on the bottom, they use nanostring to uh, determine cell of origin, again, knowing that this has some uh, impact on outcomes and likelihood of cure uh, with our CHOP, and you can see the distribution that's there. 
Now, unfortunately, as we just saw, there was no difference in PFS with a median follow-up of 29 months. And again, knowing that most of the events occur early, I think this is sufficient follow-up to, if there was a difference, we should have detected it. And there's no difference in overall survival, which again is excellent, 81% in both arms. Um, if you look at the force plot, this is hard to read, but I just wanted the visual here. To the left favors G-CHOP, to the right favors R-CHOP. There's really no difference uh, in any one of the groups. If we hone in on maybe some of the highest risk groups as we define them, for example, with the IPI, again, there's no difference based on the IPI uh, favoring uh, either antibody, maybe even a trend favoring rituximab in the highest risk group, although it is a smaller number of patients, and cell of origin, similarly, had no differential benefit depending on which antibody was used. So uh, just as we heard, our CHOP, I think, remains the standard of care for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Now, when it comes to indolent lymphoma, we have a lot more data to look at. And so I'll start first looking at the Gauss trial, which you just heard about. So again, this was relapsed follicular lymphoma, not refractory. These are people who are expected to be still sensitive to rituximab, still sensitive to anti-CD20 monotherapy. It's a head-to-head -head comparison of both an induction strategy as well as a maintenance strategy. The primary endpoint was overall response rate, and I think we can all kind of discuss whether or not that is you know, perhaps the clinically most meaningful or not. And then I did not include uh, any of the non-follicular patients. They were just a handful, and I think it's very hard to make any conclusions on that. So all patients had rituximab-sensitive disease. And as you saw, the overall response rate, uh, whether done at the time of initial evaluation or at the best overall response rate, maybe favors obinutuzumab, but, and the CR rate also, with time, seems to favor obinutuzumab. However, there's no difference in progression-free survival or overall survival. And so you could argue maybe there's a little bit of benefit here, but is that clinically meaningful? And then you also heard that if somebody has rituximab refractory, now this is the group where you would think a better antibody might have a chance to make a huge difference. And so in this trial, uh, these are all rituximab refractory patients with indolent lymphomas, and patients were randomized to, I think, a little bit of an unfair comparison, and I'll show you why, but this was bendamustine monotherapy at a dose that is fairly toxic, 120 milligrams per meter squared, going head-to-head -head against not only standard dose bendamustine, but with a monoclonal antibody and with maintenance therapy. So um, it's almost, you know, here there's two drugs versus one, with a maintenance uh, component. And the primary endpoint here is progression-free survival. And what you heard is that the obinutuzumab-containing arm was better, significantly better than bendamustine monotherapy. There was no difference in overall survival. I apologize that it's uh, covered by my box here. Um, and the median progression-free survival was not reached versus 15 months, and you saw some of the updated data. However, what would have happened if we included bendamustine and rituximab as either a third arm or as a head-to-head -head comparison? And the argument that these were all rituximab refractory patients, I think, is sort of a small piece in knowing that when we add monoclonal antibodies to subsequent chemotherapy, sometimes we see a synergistic effect even in patients who did not previously respond. And we don't really use rituximab monotherapy as often in these multiply relapsed patients. And I think if we were going to have somebody who needed chemotherapy, it should have been a chemo another chemoimmunotherapy comparison as opposed to just chemotherapy alone. The other piece I'll show is that if you look at when the benefit occurs, most of the benefit to the obinutuzumab arm is after the chemotherapy ended. In other words, it's the maintenance that's making a big difference. And so I, I think the fact that you had a maintenance versus a no maintenance comparison uh, is really unfair and makes this a very difficult study for me to interpret personally for my patients. So then we get to really, I think, one of uh, the most important studies that really does a, a fair and appropriate evaluation of looking at the two monoclonal antibodies in a frontline setting. So these are patients where if you believe that there is some intrinsic rituximab resistance, you know, about 30% of people have rituximab resistance um, at baseline, and that if you have a better anti-CD20, this is where you're going to see the difference. 
So this was a very large international phase three trial looking at previously untreated CD20 positive indolent lymphomas and randomized between G chemo and R chemo and again, keeping with sort of having a fair comparator compared to, in contrast to what I was just saying about Gadolin, there is a maintenance part that was similar between the two for two years with the antibody that was used as part of the induction. So what did we learn? We saw that with progression-free survival, obinutuzumab plus chemotherapy is better than rituximab plus chemotherapy. With a median follow-up of 35 months, the improved progression-free survival uh, has a delta of about 7%. There is no difference in overall survival, and therefore obinutuzumab was declared the winner. Well, the question here is, what are the chemotherapy backbones that were being used? And you remember it was an investigator's choice between a limited number of uh, chemotherapy backbones. Well, I think in the United States, for what market data would show us and what many of the publications would show us, is that bendamustine is really the backbone of choice. Um, although our CHOP may be making a comeback, I think for most of us, if we have a high tumor burden follicular lymphoma patient, we're using bendamustine. So what is the difference if you just look at the bendamustine patients who were treated on this study? And in an updated publication, kind of looking at the chemotherapy backbone, here is the R-benda versus the G-benda pulled out. Now look at the difference in progression-free survival. It's 4%. So again, they met their endpoint, and the question is, similar to the Hodgkin's debate, is this incremental improvement in progression-free survival uh, acceptable clinically? So it is statistically significant, is it clinically significant? And I guess what I would say is that the cost there is a cost associated with using obinutuzumab as opposed to bendamustine. There's a financial cost, certainly, which I'm, you know, as with Nancy, not an expert to go into, but what about toxicity? If you look at all adverse events, not just grade three to five, there is a consistent increase in grade one through four toxicities for the obinutuzumab arm. A lot of this is infusion reactions, but there's also more neutropenia, there's more infection, uh, and uh, there are more febrile neutropenias as well. In terms of fatal AEs, uh, there were numerically a few more in the obinutuzumab versus the rituximab arm. Again, remember, this is frontline follicular. It's really hard to, to really think about having to, uh, fatal toxicities in this population. Most of the toxic deaths were in patients who received the bendamustine, and uh, most of the grade three to five infections occurred during the maintenance portion after bendamustine. And I took this one slide out, and maybe I should have kept it in, but if you look at the toxicity profile for bendamustine, I'm sorry, for obinutuzumab or rituximab in the maintenance portion, you wonder how much IVIG, uh, how much uh, antibiotics, et cetera, need to be used, since that is where most of the toxicity falls. Looking across all studies, I think what we see in the gallium is what we also see uh, in other studies, that infusion-related reactions are increased, grade, greater than or equal to grade three uh, infusion-related toxicities are greater for obinutuzumab, as is grade three neutropenia, infections, and thrombocytopenia. So this is not something that's limited to just a one-off study, but is a consistently observed phenomenon. So I would say that Rituximab has set a bar for anti-CD20 therapy in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I don't think we've met the burden of better, safer, and cheaper uh, to use obinutuzumab instead of rituximab. Uh, and this remains the monoclonal antibody of choice in non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. So with that, I'll stop.